throughout my life, especially when I got really heavy, like within a week I'd drop 15 pounds and because your body at that weight wants to let go of it doesn't want to hold on to it. I'm interested in this weight loss journey because it's a very, it was a significant turning point in your life. And a lot of my listeners, obviously, you know, we're, we're interested in health and wellness and especially like seemingly insurmountable challenges, like mm. um, having a lot of weight to lose. What was that like for you? Well, you're right. I think I was always sort of a chubby kid, but it seemed within sort of like the limits of acceptable or it wasn't like in the red zone for most of my life. And then between kind of 14 to 17, like the impact it's had has been great. But if I really look at duration, like now as a 35 year old man, I'm like three years, that's like this. But it was such a formative time of my adolescence. And then also I always say everyone has their awkward teenage years and then they grow out of it and they swear their family to secrecy and burn their yearbooks, but mine are in reruns. Mm. And so from 14 to 17, I probably went from 220 pounds to 300 pounds. Wow. And for you, you were in the spotlight, but also weight for people that are in comedy can sometimes be used as a comedic device, which totally. I feel like can then be, adds a certain, you know, just an, just an extra variable that you have to contend with, especially when you don't desire to be that weight forever. No, I mean, I was entering into a legacy of funny fat guys, of like people would would compare me when they would hear that I was, you know, in comedy and, and overweight. They'd be like, oh, you'll be like John Candy or Chris Farley. Now, obviously these guys are geniuses and I'd be lucky to have a tenth of what they had, but they weren't comparing my talent. They were just comparing my girth hmm. and and also omitting the fact that most of those guys had pretty tragic endings and and so I knew that I was fulfilling this thing and you know Drake was sort of this more standard you know nice looking thin guy so I was like oh this is a dynamic people are used to like this is obviously working in our favor and I can play this role to the extent in which it calls for and um, and I was and I was just really good and overweight. I you know I I know guys who will put on weight. My <laughs> I don't know if I'm calling him out for this, but like my best friend Len, we joke around because he's got you know two kids and he's busy working, and so you know sometimes he'll put on an extra twenty pounds or something. You always look great to me, Len. Just know that. <laughs> <laughs> and um. But he played hockey his whole life. Like he's a natural athlete. So even the way it sits on his frame is just like more appealing. And and he's still super capable even when he's on the heavier side. I didn't have any baseline fitness. So it was just a lot of weight on no foundation. So it was it was challenging. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so how did it like what what was the impetus in your life then to 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 examine that and, and to ask like where you could maybe be doing things a little bit differently so as to were you were you cognizant of, of health at that point or was it like um you just wanted to, to see something different in the mirror i was and i i you know at that time like there was no body positivity and so no one was careful of your feelings and i almost think that people subconsciously would shame you for it in this weird way of feeling so powerless to help you that they thought, oh, maybe he just doesn't know how big he is. Hmm. Like maybe I need to scare him. And doctors, I remember my 12, at 12 years old, a doctor being like, I'm putting you on Crestor, which was like a cholesterol med. At 12 years old? At 12. Wow. And which it certainly has not been researched fully for 12 year olds. No, I know that. Definitely not. <laughs> because Mike, I, it's funny, I saw your post about that you were worried your cholesterol was like a little like teetering on like acute level of slightly <laughs> elevated. You were like, I cut out butter, I'm good. But I, I recently, mine was a little elevated and my doctor too was like, you're still a little young. She's like, we haven't really researched it in people in their mid thirties. Like we know for sure 40 and above. But I know statins, no bueno, right? We don't like statins. What do we think? You're no, not a doctor. I, no, I mean, I um, my no, I wasn't. I wasn't actually concerned about my. So my cholesterol was like 131 milligrams per deciliter, which is still within. I mean, it's like maybe high normal. You want to call it, but ah. 
but I would, um, I, I looked at all the, uh, I wouldn't make any change to my diet and lifestyle based on a single number. Mm -hmm. So everything else looked good, but, um, I wanted just as a, as a personal experiment, I wanted to see if I could bring it down by tweaking variables other than my consumption of like animal products of like mm -hmm. meat and stuff like that, because there's risk in doing that because animal products, for example, red meat, fish, which contain saturated fat, which can affect your LDL levels. You incur risk when you cut those out, cut those foods out because they're very nutrient dense foods. Mm. Um, so I wanted to see like what else I was perhaps doing in my diet and lifestyle that could have spoken for that high normal level. Um, and so I looked at my coffee, which was I was I was uh, French pressing my coffee every day. Right. When you French press coffee, there's there are compounds called diterpenes which end up in the coffee. It's one of the reasons why French press coffee is so good. It's like a very there's like all these oils that come to the top. But some of those oils, like uh, cafe stall, is a very powerful LDL increasing agent. So I started wow. filtering my coffee. I cut out the butter for the most part. I, I I still use butter, but as an indulgence, and I saw a twenty percent drop in my LDL cholesterol. Would you see that in like a Turkish coffee too, like where it's all you know, where they actually put the coffee straight into sort of the yeah the cooking device. You see, um, you see higher levels of this this LDL raising compound cafe stall in espresso, but the overall volume is lower when sure. you drink espresso. I believe you get about a milligram of this in espresso, and just for reference, you get like three to four milligrams in uh, in like French press brewed coffee. So I wouldn't be too concerned if you're just having an espresso here and there. Yeah. But if it's like if you're French pressing your coffee every day and you're prone to hypercholesterolemia, so like elevated levels of cholesterol, and I'm not like saying, oh my god, we got to get our cholesterol down. Like I think it's there's right. there's the extreme viewpoints at both ends, right? Like vegans will say we got to get our cholesterol as low as possible because it supports it's like their confirmation bias, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you have these carnivores that are walking around with, and also you know very overweight people sometimes have. Uh, very, very high levels of LDL, right? Right. You should be somewhere like in a healthy range in the middle. But I guess I would argue that if you're doing something that's purposelessly driving your LDL up, then you should probably, I don't know, maybe consider uh, tweaking the the tweaking the diet a bit. But having like, and and I've I've read a lot, and Ben Ben Greenfield, our, our mutual friend, has talked about like how. Again, there was like this arbitrary number of 200 of combined cholesterol and anything above it was couldn't be worse and anything below it was perfect when actually like it's about the specific, you know, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, all these yeah. things. But he was he's sort of a proponent of having a little bit more than what they would say is healthy because cholesterol is good. It's a, you know, it's sort of a transportation system in our body and whatnot. Right. But aren't there some carnivores who, like, I remember doing CrossFit and I'd see people like popping nine hard boiled eggs. I'm like, <laughs> there's no way that's good for you, money. <laughs> like, I know it's paleo and I know it, you're doing the whole body challenge or whatever, but there's no way. No, it's, it's interesting. So dietary cholesterol has very little impact on serum cholesterol. It does affect it acutely in the, in the short term mm -hmm. as your liver compensates. Because you eat more dietary cholesterol, your liver is going to create re less. You mm -hmm. eat less dietary cholesterol, you consume less dietary cholesterol, your liver is going to create more. But there's a bit of a, a lag time in, in how long it takes for your liver to respond. So in the short term, there might be an effect. In the, over the long term, dietary cholesterol has no no meaningful effect on your serum cholesterol, but saturated fat does. And this is different from person to person. Some people have different genes that, that um, influence how they respond to certain saturated fatty acids. Some people have familial hypercholesterolemia, which just means that their liver is exporting a crazy amount of cholesterol. Yeah. And so for, for people, for people with that condition, um, it might be prudent to take a statin. So I'm not, I'm not like umbrella anti statins or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but and I agree that for somebody who's eating uh, animal protein with saturated fat, you're going to have a, a, a level of cholesterol that it's going to be different from person to person. And it's not necessarily going to be the lowest possible number. But I'm of the opinion that eating animal proteins and, and foods that contain saturated fat that are going to drive your cholesterol up to a certain point, the benefits of doing so outweigh any risks, provided right. you're metabolically healthy, provided, you know, you're, you don't have an oversized waistline. You're not carrying a lot of visceral fat. HDL looks good. Triglycerides look good. Blood sugar looks good. All that stuff. But am I trying to like needlessly drive it up because I think it's going to like boost my health somehow? No. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, I feel like I had heard, maybe Bill Nye said this. He was like, you know, avocados have an incredible publicist. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> They're great for you. They're great. I love avocados. They are great. But, but they do. He's like, a half of an avocado is great. He's like, you crushing two a day <laughs> yes. is probably a no bueno. A little excessive. <laughs> yeah. They're very calorie dense foods. Right. You know? Yeah. That's true. They're also a fruit. They are a fruit. And up until the last hundred years, used mostly for desserts. You know, I love that. Um, what's that saying? Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Yes, that's great. <laughs> I guess same with avocados. Although I guess avocados with fruit, it's not that bad of a with like. No, yeah. like a you know it'd be nice, a nice little like um, orangey, maybe a sumo orange with some avocado with slices and a little olive oil. Yeah. So Damn, Come making on, me hungry. Right? Yeah, so Baby. good. Do you cook? I don't. My wife cooks and my wife's vegan. I'm sorry. She's vegan. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I won't bring her around. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> my, my, my wife, Keep her away from me. <laughs> my wife is actually vegan in a, a the the best way in that like she's really about like she's quietly about the life. Like she support it's not just for the dietary thing. Like I'm sure on some level she was like, if I could not hurt anyone and have a piece of bacon every now and then, maybe I'd do that. Yeah. You know? I'm, I I mean, I'm pro eating whatever people want to eat. Totally. Um, so I support that. And uh, I'm not like a, like an, a diet, like authoritarian, like, you know, trying to push my, my diet on everybody. It's, and, and, and I do think that the best, the best argument to be vegan is that you don't like eating meat. Like you just don't like it. And that's my wife. That's your wife. Yeah. Exactly. That's totally, totally valid and reasonable, and I will not try to argue anybody out of that. <laughs> but That's... I, I know what you mean, and I agree. Like it's, it's the, the absolutes that really, you know, one way is the right thing or the other. I watched that guy Liver King. Is that who he is? He's insane. He terrifies me. Not, not natty either. Like that guy is, he's on. He's, he, okay, good. Sub substances other than liver. Bless I'll him. Just leave it at that. Bless <laughs> him. Bless him. My brother, my brother loves him. I don't follow him, but I, I see him sometimes pop up. On the explore page and just but like and i i think there are other people now who i'm seeing are making a habit of like raw liver blood yeah <laughs> like, too much for me i'm not it I is mean, right yeah. i like you know i like following you on the ground listen max i'm a fan thanks my man. son's name is max not after you is it Whoa. but I, i'm i'm glad to know there are a bunch of good maxes in the yeah, world dude we are, up to. i love that i love that well <laughs> likewise and I was watching you were you posted something the other day and like you were at not a fancy restaurant. You might have been in a wood ranch. I was in a wood ranch. <laughs> you were at a wood ranch. And it was like How did you know that? You eat a wood ranch. I love wood ranch. It's it's great. Be the app the bees, the apple bees. I like any kind of chain restaurant. But you were like but you know what? It was like a a the kind of healthy meal that a lot of us could eat. And there wasn't like a judgment around it. Like you had like some corn and I think some like broccoli and just like grilled chicken. Yeah. And like, yeah, anybody can do that. And I feel like a lot of guys in in the circle that I'm interested in or certain guys and gals, like the barrier to entry can feel a little bit too high. And like a post like that, I'm like, look, like someone, because that's the truth, because many of us are going to Wood, Wood Ranch. Yeah. And like. Yeah, maybe you could get a more nutrient dense meal at like a straight farm to table place, but like overall, this was a win. Oh, oh like, total win! I mean, you know, it's not organic. You know, it's like they're using weird oils, but they just don't order order don't order oily foods. Right. Yeah, I get. I like Wood Ranch a lot, dude. It's great. Sponsor the show, Wood Ranch. I think because we're city kids, and so like things like Wood Ranch are very like that's like a very suburban. It, is it? Yeah. yeah. So so it attracts us because it's like not it's like exotic. It's a novelty. Yeah. yeah, it's exotic. Yeah. No, but they have a great. They have an amazing. So this is a, this is a meal that I regularly get, and I want to know your Wood Ranch order. But yeah. I usually get uh, the roasted ch half chicken. It's like a rotisserie chicken. Rotisserie chicken, by the way, you can find it most supermarkets. It's bomb. It's like it's eight great. eight dollars for a freaking whole chicken. Mm -hmm. You can eat the chicken. You can make bone broth with the with the leftover bones. Yes. So I get this rotisserie chicken, which is 10 out of 10, really good. And then I'll usually get like steamed broccoli, some grilled asparagus. They make it really easy to, to eat healthy. From a macro standpoint, it's freaking great. Yeah, I, I think so. Costco get two rotisserie chickens for like under 10 bucks. Is Wood Ranch, by the way, a national chain? Like people know about? I'm... I don't know. I'm, I've been DMing with them. Uh, first of all, I'll make the intro. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I was there with my son the other day for the first time. It's the best part is introducing your kid to your favorite like chain restaurant. 
and uh, and I just tagged them in a post, and they were like, "Hey, love to have you back." And I was like, "Food Ranch, you have my heart." <laughs> I eat there all the time in LA, just like outing myself. We're but at the Grove. At the Grove, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's moving. It's freaking good. I'm sorry to break it to you. It's, it's leaving the Grove. It is. Yeah. And it's reopening it. I mean, this is like some real LA insider baseball guy. So enjoy. <laughs> this is uh, it's reopening. Remember where Bandera was on mm. Wilshire and Barrington? No, Wilshire and Barrington. So on the west side, it's moving. Yeah, yeah. more west. Yeah. Damn. I know. It's that okay. sucks. Fuck. It's a nice time. Where are you gonna take your dates? I don't, know. I don't take my dates to Wood Ranch. Why? Yeah. Well, I mean, Why don't you be yourself, Max? <laughs> bring your cat I've, yes. and bring a date <laughs> to Wood Ranch. This is Max. All right, all right, <laughs> I'll do it. But uh, I don't. I, I feel like. I mean, maybe it would say something good about about me to bring a date there, like that. I'm like, you know, no frills. What are you gonna go to Soho House? <laughs> Soho. Come on, you know they've been there. <laughs> they, a million times. <laughs> what? But that's uh, something I'm dying to ask you because again, like I love, I love our mutual friend. Wait, ben. you didn't, you didn't tell me your Wood Ranch order. Oh, my Wood, the rolls, just garlic just rolls. Just the rolls. The, no, I, I mean, listen, if I'm, if I'm not trying to be good, I'll do the crazy, beautiful barbecue chicken salad with all the things that makes it like 1,500 calories, like the chips. So when you're not trying to be good, you still go for a salad. Yeah, because I know that it's it's not really salad there. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, I'm aware. And then if I'm trying to be good, yeah, I'll do like a chicken breast thing and maybe like with a rice mm. and um, and like a broccoli or whatever. And I mean, I've been at this weight since I was 19. So I've somehow tricked myself into enjoying that food. Like, I don't I don't I want to know what the key like lever points of leverage have been for you that you've used to like to not just because you've lost a significant amount of, of weight which is impressive but it's not the most impressive thing. The most impressive thing is that you've kept it off. Yeah. Which I think is a big challenge for many for many people. Yeah, I I think look, I knew that my mom has struggled with weight stuff throughout a lot of her life. My grandfather dropped dead when he was 50. I mean, they don't know why. It was 1960, but like from what my mom says, he, he, he smoked, drank, and ate, and it just was over. Hmm. And so I come from a family of, like, bigger people. And so I knew that, like, food was this menacing force to the pecs. Like, it just, it seems like we can't escape it. And I knew that at 17, like, I was on TV, so I had opportunities to go to a party or do things that are thoroughly, you know, adolescent-type things. But I would hold myself back because I wasn't comfortable. And, and so I felt like I'm going to miss out on like my late teens and my early 20s. And then until when? Until I do this thing. And so it would be incumbent on me to do it now. And I, I just, um, I think I was on Atkins at like 10. Whoa. Like, which... Is Atkins not just early keto? Dr. Atkins really got a bad rap, no? <laughs> he did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, he, was, he was very uh, prescient uh, in, yeah. in his, his advocacy for the low-carb diet. Because it was low-carb, but his thing was more like eat cheeseburgers. Oh, and yeah. Heavy cream in your coffee. Dirty just. keto or like whatever. Just like lots and lots of like cream cheese. and Right. Yeah. However you wanted to do it. Right. But so I had tried like – and, and – Throughout my life, especially when I got really heavy, like within a week I'd drop 15 pounds and because your body at that weight wants to let go of it. It doesn't want to hold on to it. And uh, and then in inevitably it just wasn't sustainable and I would put it right back on. And so when I was 17, through a couple work things, a couple working through some emotional stuff, I was like finally ready to do it. And I remember I would go back to New York every summer. We'd spend two months there and... I just started walking because I knew that like I had tried to go to the gym and it was humiliating and everything kind of hurt. But I was like, I know I can walk these streets. I know these streets like the back of my hand. I'm just going to walk and I put in my headphones and dream about what my life was going to be. And I started eating healthier and it became like, well, I'm not going to eat perfectly. I'm not going to have a chicken Caesar, but maybe I'll have a chicken Caesar wrap. Hmm. And like, that was a win. And I'm not going to eat junk food, but maybe I'll have some dried pineapple or dried apple. So it was like slowly, but surely, or, or a real indulgence would be like, um, the smart foods, popcorn, <laughs> like yeah, the white cheddar. Remember in the black bag at the bodega, oh, the smart yeah. foods. 
So good. But those were like those little compromises I was making. And then, and then if I really blacked out and hit up a Mr. Softy, like I would, <laughs> I'd wake up, you know, the next day and I'd be like, okay, I did that. But it's like, it doesn't, ha I don't have to reset. Like mm. I can live to fight another day. And I just put a bunch of those days sort of in a row. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. And you said that the gym was what? Humil humiliating or it was yeah. just, why? Just sports in general, I think where I, I just, it's funny now, right? Cause I'm 35 and I've been working out now consistently for 10 plus years. So I'm like, oh, I could have been good, but I just, no one played sports with me. Like, hmm. so I was just so, you know, I, I was just hopeless when it came to sports and athletics and I just didn't, and I like, I, I was vain. I didn't want to embarrass myself and, and I had no cardio. So it was like, it was just a bad mix of, of things. Like I would just get winded really quick. I couldn't do a push up. That was, it's something I talk about in the book where shout out my first trainer, Ronaldo, who was a buddy of mine who lived in my building. And when I really started to work out and I'd already lost like 60 pounds, I'm like, okay, I don't feel like everyone's going to stare at me at the gym. Like there's a lot of people who are 40 pounds overweight at mm -hmm. the gym. And, and so I would go and he'd say, all right, we're going to do a push up." And I'm like, that's cute. I was like, but I won't be doing one because that's impossible. Wow. Because I've never done one. Wow. And he's like, no, we are. And he's like, you're going to do it from your knees. And I said, I can't do it from my knees. You just didn't, didn't have the upper body strength? Mm -mm. Wow. I'd just been, because I didn't have any foundation. Yeah. And. You'd never exercised. You weren't an athlete. You were just. No, but I wasn't like slothful. I totally worked out and did stuff, but I was just always heavy. Yeah. I was, I'm typical, bro. I was like an asthmatic kid. Wow. Like, I just had a lot against me in that area, but I always played hockey with my buddies or like group sports. I just kind of, so he was like, I'm going to take a towel and wrap it around your waist and you're going to go on your knees and I'm going to kind of be like use leverage to help you and you just use as much of your arms as you can. And we did that for a month. And wow. then we lost the towel. And then and then as I lost more weight, suddenly, and I had to do that with a pull-up and with all these different exercises. And now when I can like rep out, I'm not gonna brag, five Damn. strict, strict pull-ups. But you know, like that's such a metric, like someone like, you know, Umax, it's nothing. No, 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 pull-ups are hard. But dude, uh, no one can do pull-ups. Yeah, dude, pull-ups are very uh, pull-ups are a, co a complex movement. Like I'm still I'm still trying. Like I love um my good friend Sal De Stefano always talks mm. about how you should think of exercise as a practice, and that the goal when you go to the gym should be not to lift more weight or to do more pull-ups, but to just to master the pull-up and to get better and better at doing a pull-up. Mm. And for me, like I've I I've been at a cap of the number of pull-ups that I can do for, for quite some time. I mean, it, it like varies day to day depending on how I feel Sure, generally, but that's amazing. Five pull-ups. I, yeah, I mean, I can, I'm really good at like simple military type, like I'm really good at push-ups, and I can do, you know, 50 if I'm really pushed, wow. I might have to take a break at 35, <laughs> <laughs> but like, but that was important to me because they were so impossible for so long. Love that. Yeah, and you if you wanted to get to ten, you could get to ten. If you, did, I mean, if yeah. you just do did them every day, like it's just you have to want to do that. But the yeah. but the fact that you've come so far, I mean, that's so that's so great, such an achievement. Oh yeah, I mean, I remember doing pull ups with the band, and then you know finally, and and shout out CrossFit, which also I, I tore my pec doing that. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, damn. Josh oh, Peck wow. tore his pec. Wow. Yeah. Look at that. Give that to the viewers, right? Make here, make this a wallpaper. Battle for wounds, the, or yeah. The thumbnail for the episode. <laughs> um, I um, but kipping, which uh, you know, certainly there's a school that says it's just straight cheating, but I was like, oh, like I I'm, I'm actually doing this without assistance now, and that was huge. And mm. then eventually, I can kind of actually do it without any momentum. What did exercise do to your? I mean, mental health. Like exercise for me, but I mean, one of the major reasons why I. I have loved to work out for so long is is feeling subjectively like what it does to my brain mm. and my mind. Did you see a shift there? It's everything. Those natural endorphins, that kind of just yeah, I, I, it was it. It's for me like the the thing that keeps me going. Like I I think if physically I couldn't see any more progress if if 
you know, God came down and was like, you're, you, this will be your body forever. And like, just accept it. I would still do it for that little bit of relief, that serotonin dump that, yeah, it's everything. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. And so your diet, like how has that how has that evolved? Like what's the, what's your current like plan? What, you know, what, what's the current like way of eating that you found to be sustainable? Could be better, Max. Could be better. I, um, I, I basically, if I'm being honest, I, um, I, I'm, I'm doing like a calorie counting all day in my head. Hmm. I basically know the calories of everything. I would love to be in a contest and like to have them put like four ounces of chicken or, you know, but I, I also know like what's in a Big Mac <laughs> mm. like, and not that I'm eating Big Macs often, but I just kind of know and I'm constantly gauging in my head. Well, if I worked out and I had a pretty like if I had a boxing workout, so I know that's probably roughly in an hour, five to 700 calories if I really pushed it and I need 2000 calories not to die. So I'm playing with about 2700 of house money. And if I can stay a little under that, I'll feel great tomorrow if I'm just sort of at the same level, I'll feel fine. And if I go above it, well, then I got to do better tomorrow. Was there a light bulb moment for you when you when you started to realize how calorie dense certain foods can be? Because I feel like a lot of people are gen genuinely not aware of how many calories a bit uh, of uh, a, a meal at a fast food place could be, for example, just the mm -hmm. calorie density of modern foods. The fact that a burger at one of these fast food joints can be 1200 calories or a, a coffee drink at one of these big chains can have, I don't know, five, 600 calories in it. Right. Um, was that, I mean, was, was that something that you, that, that kind of blew your mind when you, when you first discovered? What blows my mind more honestly is like probably if, you know, I go to cheesecake factory and one of my faves, cause though like, you could order a pasta dish, which is your calories for the day, right? Yeah, a cheesecake? Yeah, easily. Easily. The chicken Romano. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. He knows. But like, yeah, there's certain where it's like 2,200 calories. If there's a cream sauce and it's a plate wow. full of like farfalla and a, and a fried chicken breast, you're done. Yeah. And for me, it was like a lot of quantity. I was like a big quantity eater and... I was thinking about this recently, like my mom who tried to lovingly intervene in my habit as a young kid, like was, would say, you're 12, you only need two slices of New York pizza. <laughs> like these are not small slices. I'm just capping you. And every single time I was like, I want more. Wow. Like I dreamed of when I could go have three or four slices. So when I was 14, 15, really putting on weight, that's what it was, right? I was like, no, I've always had to go to the birthday party and have two or three slices. Like, I want the whole pizza. When I started eating that way was really when the wheels popped off. So what's amazing to me now and doing this, you know, this book tour that you and I are both sort of in the midst of, I did The View in New York. Shout out, love my gals. <laughs> and... uh and, you know, after it was done, uh, you know, leading up days before, I'm like, keep the diet tight, got to look good. You know what I mean? It's, it's worldwide, whoopee. <laughs> and so then when we are done, I was like, I'm in New York. I'm going to go to my favorite pizza joint and have at it. I could not physically finish more than two slices. Wow. And, like, my eye, I was like, who cares? Like, I'm going in hard body karate. I'm, I'm a sober guy. This is all I have. I'm married. <laughs> like, there's nothing else. <laughs> like... And I tried to eat, not like I used to, but I'm like, I'm really going to paint the town. And it was like, after two slices, I, like I could have pushed myself, wow. but it wouldn't have been good. And I'm like, this is a miracle. What's your favorite uh, pizza spot? Like where, where, where's the place that you went to? Um, in New York. Like I like Joe's on, on Bleecker. I like, um, I, 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 this is kind of corny touristy stuff. I like the artichoke slice. On what, 14th Street? Well, there it's on 14th and 1st, so there's one now on Broadway. There's mm. one on 10th Avenue. Wow. But, I mean, it's basically a, a pizza slice with, like, an entire serving of spinach <laughs> artichoke dip on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, God. You and know what? Prince I, Street's good, too. Prince Street Pizza? Yeah, that's one of my, 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 one of my best friends. His favorite pizza in the world is Prince Street. That's funny. I've never had an artichoke pizza. Because when that place opened up, I had already been on my sort of, like, health journey. 
Yeah. And uh, and so I never I never had that. But growing up, I would crush pizza, and I also loved the Jamaican pe- beef patties. Oh, so good! So they don't good, have right? Them here. They don't have them here. Yeah. Did you go to Imperial Pizza on Thirty Fourth and Third, next to Jackson Hole? For Imperial, yeah, I must have. Yeah, the name rings a bell. Yeah, and there was a Tivoli Diner. There was a great place in Murray Hill, though. It was called. Um, it was by the library, the Kipps Bay Library. Ooh. On, I forget the name of the, the pizza place, but it was really good. So good. Yeah. Such good food. Damn. So what? How many consecutive days in a row have you eaten? Let's just say, like, I'm, I know it's a lifestyle, like that you naturally eat pretty clean, but. How many consecutive days in a row have you gone with like ha- not having anything remotely bad? Uh, I mean, it's pre- it's pretty it's pretty common. But when I bad for, bad like quote unquote in air quotes bad is relative. Like so for me, I um you know like I, if I'm at like Wood Ranch and I really want to indulge, for example, I'll do the I'll do like the baby back ribs, which I freaking love. There. Mm. But I know that the like the the meat sourcing it's covered in sauce like, you know. So that to me is like an an, an indulgent meal. If I'm doing if I want like something sweet, I'll go to, I'll go to like an Arowan or Whole Foods and I'll buy something like that tastes indulgent, that's sweet, that has sugar in it, but maybe like better than what you would find. You know, m- no refined grain flour. Maybe it's got some mm. some like more nutrient dense flour that it's made of or something like that. I'll never go to like a Krispy Kreme and, and, and you wouldn't do that and just like lose my shit. No, I wouldn't do that. Would you go to uh like not a fancy pizza joint, like um a dollar slice that doesn't exist anymore, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. hole in the wall place in New York. I mean, it's like APC flour <laughs> or APF flour. Yeah. Yeah. AP flour. Yeah. Um, I mean, I grew up eating that stuff, but I haven't had like a real like slice of pizza made of like wheat flour in maybe a decade at this point. Yeah, it's been a long time. I'll eat pizza sometimes and I feel indulgent like when I'm doing it if it's like a maybe like a gluten free or like a cauliflower crust. So that's kind of how I eat and I, I enjoy it. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, but no, I mean, I just don't. Yeah, I don't I don't feel like I just I, I, I'm, I've gotten really good at like curating my food environment. And, you know, all the foods that I eat, like, I feel really like my, my body feels good. I feel like I'm, I don't, I'm not like depriving myself. Not rest- I eat a ton. Like I really do. Like I fill myself up. Um, and, uh, and I also do snack. Like I snack a lot. And when I snack, I like, I don't, you know, like I can, I can easily go through a bag of whatever chip that I, that I enjoy or. I but mean, it's healthy chips. It's like healthier. Cassava, yeah, flour, yeah. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All that stuff. What about, because like when I came here, you were, you had just pulled granola out of the oven. Yes. You make it. <laughs> I made it. No, I made it. Yeah, but I may, I'm making it to because it's a recipe that's in the cookbook. It's not like normally you come to my house and I'm oh, like really? baking granola like, <laughs> Fair. like Mel Betty Crocker, you know? I mean, I, I, obviously you and I don't know each other super well, but like from following you, you on Instagram and just now, like, would you say that you are, of, of people in your space, would you say you are kind of the median, like of obsessiveness and in a good way, or are you kind of the of, on the lighter side? Because sometimes these people who like, I enjoy following, but I'm like, your life looks like just catty cornered and miserable. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. It's too intense. Yeah, I mean, I, I genuinely think that... Um... I mean, I do think that I'm in the middle in, in certain regards, mm. um, but there are certainly some in the, in the nutrition space, especially also from the medical and nutritional orthodoxy that would say that I'm extreme, right? Because I don't, I don't eat, consume a grain-based diet, um, which is the norm. Right. But, uh, but no, I think that I think that like my recommendations, they're gra- they tend to be grounded in in science, but not just science, like common sense, the evolutionary lens, pragmatism. Um, so yeah, I guess I would say that I'm, I'm the most balanced. I mean, I'm certainly not anywhere near as extreme as like a liver king, but even like Ben Greenfield, like Ben, Ben is great, right? right. He serves a purpose. Like, you know, he's, he's sure. got an important voice in this space, but, uh, but he's also like, he has a certain look to uphold, right? Like that guy is like shredded. Oh my gosh. 24 hours a day. How? I don't, I mean, but also a little bit genetics. Probably. Cause then I think he said his father also like might have been in some athletic stuff and he was a yeah. he was um what like a lifter he's a, a major bodybuilder yeah he was he, be, 
at the beginning of this. Yeah. So his base is pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I don't have those those genetics. I've been lifting for twenty years at this point. <laughs> right. And uh, and like, look at me, you know. Like, I mean, I I feel like I, I keep I eat a lot and I keep a, a body composition that I'm that I'm happy with. I'm not like shredded or anything like that. Like, right. I'm, I'm I hover around 15, 14, 15 percent body fat. I think something like that. Yeah. Um, but I think the most important thing is that you feel good. You feel mm -hmm. good in your body. That really is the most important thing. It's not about like a certain body composition. It's about feeling good. It's about having objective biomarkers, right? To, to validate your subjective sense of how you're doing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and, and eating things that are not just good for the body sometimes, but good for the soul. That's yeah. important, right? What do you think about like my, my only beef and, and, and I say this because I am such a big fan of sort of the health and wellness community. And my only beef is when people become, in my opinion, and I don't think you're guilty of this at all, is they become like cavalier with their beliefs. Yeah. That they become so staunch right. and so anti-allopathic medicine, like so anti-traditional medicine right. that I think it's almost like dangerous uh, to propagate, right? Yeah. I'm not like that at all. I, yeah. ho I hope that my listeners You're not. know that, you know, like get that from yeah. me. But um, but no, I mean, I, I think there's a, a place for allopathic medicine. Um, right. A hundred, a hundred thousand percent. And like I'm, a knee replacement. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> you know? of course, man. Well, because the thing is, I, I can't, I came to this because my mom was incredibly sick. My mom had a very tragic life. I don't know if you know the full story, but 30,000 feet, my mom got very sick at a young age. Despite living a life, her whole life, she she tried to be healthy. She was a very health conscious woman. Mm. New Yorker, affluent, like had access to healthy food. Yeah. Um, read the read the New York Times every day. Watched the watched the mainstream media. Read books. Um, but at fifty eight, she developed a, a rare form of of dementia. She was still wow. young and youthful in the prime of her life, and then that that persisted for about eight years. And then in August of two thousand eighteen, she on top of the dementia, developed pancreatic cancer and passed away. Wow. Three months later. So, um, so I know the, I know, I mean, if, if there was a, a treatment for her or a magic pill or, or, or procedure that could have helped her, I would have been all in on that. Right. So I'm not dogmatic in, in any sense. And I also know that everybody's different and that what I believe to be true today might be overturned by science tomorrow. Science is a continually evolving thing. So I think it's really important to always hedge your bets. That's right. why, like I say that I'm not, I wouldn't, I'm not too concerned about LDL cholesterol, right? Because it's been for so long, it's been this thing that like ha has been co-opted by the pharmaceutical industry, right? Your, your LDL is too high here, take a statin. Right. Um, but so, so I think like a certain amount of skepticism is is healthy and warranted, right? Because sure. um, because there is just so much money attached to these to these drugs. But also like why not hedge your bets? Like why drive it up needlessly if you don't have to? Like is it going to make you feel any better? Is it going to make your hair grow faster? Is it <laughs> right. like what's the point? You know, if all the if all the science is suggesting that um, that. If it's too high, like why do you want, why why would you want it to be too high, right? Like there right. there is data to suggest that it is an independent risk factor when it's too when it's high for cardiovascular disease, right? Right. Um, so uh, yeah, so I try not to be too too dogmatic in my approach. No, I think that's the right move, and I like I always want to say like because uh, there will be certain people who will have like a, a good sized following, and I'm like. Let me, let me see the credence, you know? Let me see. <laughs> the credence. <laughs> and, they'll, and they'll be like, they'll be like talking so much crap about like a, a Western doctor. And I'm like, listen, even not a great doctor, like spent 12 years doing this thing. Like, yeah. and has to go through like a lot of like, and, and I think you're right. That's such a great way to say it is like a healthy amount of skepticism while also accepting that like there's a, a time and a place for everything yeah like embrace it all maybe yeah i'm not um and i think that this is true certainly for people for what people have witnessed over the past two years i'm i'm personally i've never been a big i've never had a big authority bias and i've never been a big credentialist like mm -hmm. i certainly think that like when you when you're sick you should go to the doctor right but you have to understand that doctors are people they're totally they're influenced by bias I mean, in a, in a perfect world, they're not, right? Mm. But but even medicine, even even evidence-based medicine can be, uh, to some, 
like a, a religious, um, you know, like a like a religious alignment. Uh, I had Andy Weil on the podcast, and you know, there's a lot of people that disagree with some of his views, but he was saying that for a lot of practitioners of evidence based medicine, they they practice it almost like it's like a they're it's like religious fundamentalism, you know. So right. I, I like to take the stance of being evidence based, but not not evidence bound, and certainly. You know, there are publicly many people with very long lists of credentials after their names that put out really biased stuff. Like, right. you know, I'm again, nothing against vegans, but there are a lot of like prominent vegan doctors that completely misconstrue construe the science. So I think credentials right. serve a purpose. But ultimately, my I think my purpose is to help empower people to think to to think for themselves right. with regard to their health. Right. Because that's probably the problem, right? It's just people aren't thinking at all, good or bad. They're just yeah. kind of like consuming and getting through their day. Yeah. They're just like mindlessly like, you know, whether it's eating the food or consuming the information, it's all fairly low quality. Yeah. I think we've got to just dial up the quality a bit more, both with regard to the food that we're consuming, with regard to the information that we're ingesting, um, and so many other areas of life the books that we're reading happy people are annoying in in stores now yeah they so, should put our books together in the store it'd be cute why wh why are happy people annoying well i think that i spent most of my life thinking that happy people were um the generationally wealthy or um athletic people uh attractive people just people who seemed at a default level of happiness mm. and i found that incredibly annoying <laughs> <laughs> But the reality was, was that I felt like I was born without the same manual for life that it seemed everyone else was equipped with because I was insecure, I was too sensitive, hyper-analytical, I thought too much, felt too hard. And it wasn't, the only way I was able to find happiness for me was by walking through these experiences, facing life on life's terms, not trying to world, live in the world that I thought I deserved, but instead, living in the world that is mm. and you know redefining what happiness was for me by walking through these life life challenges with with a bit of grace interesting so is this like the josh peck manual for living is this what you've originally i one of the first title ideas was like a uh the the field the field guide to life then there was like uh the millennial handbook <laughs> <laughs> and those are all terrible names but you know, it's it's a memoir. It's a self help book. Hiding is a memoir, huh. and if if it is a memoir, it's a reluctant one because who writes one at thirty five? What am I nuts? <laughs> like, but I think the idea was like, I love self help books, and I love listening to people who have walked the path before me. I think sometimes when people write these things at fifty or sixty, it's easy to think of these people as these these gurus and and maybe they couldn't quite understand what it feels like to be 25 and lost or 30 and have, you know, like me at 30, like my life was pretty great. And, and yet there was still an emotional part of me that felt like, I don't know, you know, I've been acting since I was 10 and I've had a good amount of, of success. And I'm still here at 30 thinking, I don't know what the hell to do with my life. And so I wanted to write it at 35 at this inflection point so that all those feelings were fresh and I could speak to people our age and younger and say like, I know what you're going through. And this is just like, this is, you know, views from the halfway point. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. That would have been a good book title. Not bad. Or subtitle. Next one. Yeah. Next one. Gotta write it quick. <laughs> nice. New York Times. Put yeah. me on the list. Take note. Then I'll get another deal. <laughs> we love an advance. We do. We love an <laughs> love an advance. <laughs> love an advance. The photo is really is really great. It's so punchable. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I've actually I've never used that phrase, but some people, yeah, but a very punchable face. I could see how some people might. Yeah, just want to give it a quick jab. Yeah. It's um yeah, that's my face and <laughs> I think look, I grew up and and I I've made not made my peace with it sounds like it's a negative. I've embraced how lucky I am to have been like this guy from, you know, the family show and you know, last year I was doing the show Turner and Hooch for Disney Plus, which was more like I I feel honored that that's where I I sort of found my my niche, hmm. you know, and uh Zach Braff, I had him on my pod, um, Male Models. It's about 
just being a male model. Um, I remember I had him on my pod once and he told this great story about how it was like the late 90s and George Clooney and Russell Crowe were, were on a plane together. And Russell Crowe gets off the plane and he's like a very proper movie star. And so I think people are a little intimidated to approach him and he sort of walks by. And then George Clooney gets off the plane and he's on ER. So he gets off and everyone goes, George! <laughs> like, because they invited him into their homes every week. Mm. Like, they felt like he was part of the family. So me being who I am, where, you know, a, a, a certain amount of people grew up with me, I was like, how do I do the greatest bait and switch ever and put my <laughs> dumb face on the cover and then write a book about feelings and the things that are really important? I think it's great, man. It's a beautiful package. Great cover. Hey, man, you're a beautiful package. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Likewise. Oh, man. Where can people where can people pick it up? Um, they can get it at Diesel Bookstores or Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, wherever uh, books are sold. What's been like the most fun aspect of writing and, and releasing a book so far? I, um, let's see. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the writing portion. Yeah. Like, weirdly i like having you know so much of my career and i talk about it in the book has been about trying to circumvent the gatekeepers because in traditional movies and tv like you have to have a casting director executive producer director and then eventually a studio executive all aligned so that you get that part right everybody's got to sign off on you everyone's going to sign off and then you make it and you pray that it's good and you wait a year and a half and maybe it's good but in most cases it's kind of Meh. Hmm. And I did that for so long and it was driving me crazy. And it wasn't until I started doing things like my book and social media and these speaking gigs where I sort of took my power back and really sort of curated something where I was like, I have to take that leap of faith and believe like what I find cool, others will too. And uh, so this book is a perfect example of that because I just kind of got to sit and I was really lucky to have my buddy Ryan Holiday, who was my advisor on the book, who basically told me when it sucked and when it was good. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I enjoyed writing it. Do you? How do you? What's your feeling about the writing of the book? Are you? I mean, I, I, th that it kind of what you just um, described echoes sort of my my experience with writing a book, right? Mm -hmm. And and my experience in media, Hollywood, even. Um, and the fact that there are typically so many gatekeepers that stand in the way of you expressing yourself. And then you take something like health science, which is typically uh, a domain for people with credentials and um, something communicated. You've got to be a journalist for the mainstream media, for example, to, to really get the word out about like your take on the science. Sure. Um, and so I, yeah, I too, I, you know, started on, on social media. I mean, I had a platform, I, you know, I did TV for a few years, but, um, but yeah, I took to social media and then I, I really embraced the, the challenge to write a book because writing a book you do in isolation, you don't have to, you do it by yourself. You don't have to worry about, um, huge crews and producers and whatever. You just, you write it by yourself and then you work with an editor and then you set it out into the world. Yeah. And it's just a really, um. Yeah, it's just a really like seamless, beautiful process where you get a lot more probably creative say w when writing a book than you do probably in, in most other creative fields. Yeah. Movies, I mean, for sure, I would, I would imagine. I like book people. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, it's just a totally different animal, you know. Yeah, especially if this were a script, it would be... Um, you know, I'd be two years in and, and on my 11th revision. Oh, man. And, you know, pretty... Do you get to do that? You get to, like, r suggest revisions on scripts or... Well, I mean, if you write a script, you never know. I mean, it can oh, be... Oh, yeah, if you were, to, like, to write one. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could be in turnaround. You can... I mean, everyone's weighing in. And then, and then sometimes you get, like, a big... My buddy, like, had this brilliant script and there were, like, three... Throughout over five years, there were three massively famous people attached to it. And each one would say, I like it. I want to do it. Here's my notes. And they'd spend nine months working on it. And then their schedule would change and they couldn't do it. Wow. And yeah. So Damn. this is like, give it to the people. Let them decide. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed that conversation, you're going to love this one. We need to break down bread. We have okay. to examine and investigate 
what bread is. Yeah. At its core. Yeah. At, I its, don't, at its essence. I don't know if I know what bread is. Yeah. Like, scientifically. Well, I define bread as one of humanity's oldest processed foods. It's something that occasionally masquerades as a, as a health food, um, but is a processed food. And there are varying it, it, bread as we currently define it. It exists in a multitude of different forms with varying degrees of processing. Um, and some are better than others. Um, I think the way that most people consume bread today is in the form of commercial breads, which tend to be, which tend to fall under the food category of ultra processed foods. So these are the kind of foods that in general we want to minimize, but there are breads that are less processed and we'll talk about those as well. Okay. Um, but generally when people use the term bread, they're talking about uh, a baked product made generally of wheat flour, yeast, water, and um, generally that it's, it's very simple to make bread. It's again, it's one of humanity's oldest foods, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like literally in the Bible, um, the consumption of bread. Today, uh, you can buy it, you find it usually in the aisles of the supermarkets. We have whole aisles dedicated to all the, all the different breads that there are out there. You've got whole wheat bread, you've got white bread, you've got multi-grain bread. Um, and again, the, the form that it takes that most people consume it today is in this, this ultra processed form. And usually there are uh, ingredients lists that are quite long, mm -hmm. much longer than they need to be to create bread. Again, because bread, you can actually create bread with some very simple ingredients. But today you'll find manufacturers adding sugar to bread, um, whether it's cane sugar or it's usually high fructose corn syrup. There are a number of different oils that are added to bread. I've seen canola oil and soybean oil added to commercial breads. You really have to look at the at the package of the bread itself and look at the ingredients list to see what it is that you're eating when you consume a product simply labeled as bread. Um, now, bread has a number of different attributes to it that I think it's worth being mindful of. So for one, bread is the primary source in the American diet of gluten. And gluten okay. is a protein made up of, it's actually, it can be broken down into two distinct peptides, glutenin and gliadin. And most, all people actually have trouble digest, fully digesting gluten. No human can properly digest gluten, according to Dr. Alessio Fazano, who's one of the world's foremost experts in gluten and autoimmunity. And what happens when we consume gluten is that it stimulates in some more so than in others. And I'll talk about who that, what that, what those populations look like, but it stimulates a protein in the gut called zonulin, which is a protein that, um, what it does is it regulates the tight junctions between the epithelial cells in the gut. So the interior contents of your gut, it's called your gut lumen. And that actually technically is the environment because what's in your gut is not inside you, even though it's inside you in the functional sense, it's not actually in you. It's not in your system, right? Yeah. And for nutrients to pass into you to become absorbed and assimilated and utilized by your body, they have to get into circulation. They have to leave the gut lumen and pass through this epithelial layer mm -hmm. and get into circulation so that your body can sort out the nutrients, send them to all the various different distal parts of your body. And in the presence of gluten, we see an expression of this protein called zonulin, which basically makes those tight junctions loosen up a little bit. And so that can allow larger molecules to pass through that shouldn't otherwise be able to. Okay. Now, this happens to a very exaggerated degree in people with celiac disease, which is a condition that affects 1% of the population. Okay. Um, it's very common. Well, 1% is, is, I guess, not super common, but... Um, there are a lot of people with celiac disease that don't know that they have celiac disease. So celiac disease, it's been speculated that actually quite a number of cases are undiagnosed. A, a significant portion of people with celiac disease don't know that they have it because symptoms of celiac disease, although we often think of them as being purely gastrointestinal in origin, can manifest uh, extraintestinally, so outside of the GI system. Mm -hmm. Um, and can manifest as brain fog, depression, things like that. The gold standard way in which celiac disease is diagnosed is with endoscopy. So they'll basically like stick a, yeah. uh, you know, something down your throat, tube. tube down your throat, grab a piece of, uh, grab a section of villi, which mm -hmm. are basically the cells that absorb nutrients in the small intestine, and then do a biopsy yeah. to see if those cells have been damaged by gluten um, or by antibodies to gluten, which then create this autoimmune 
environment um, in the gut. Outside of people with celiac disease, there are people with a condition called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So these are people that don't have celiac disease. So they don't have the autoimmune condition known as celiac disease, but they still have symptoms that emerge when they consume gluten. And, uh, and this again, you know, it's sort of this like murky syndrome that is not, um, all too well defined in the literature because it's a, it's hard to find people with this condition. Um, gluten is so common in the standard American diet that getting people to do elimination diets is not super easy. It's not like people do elimination diets of their own accord, right? You have to be instructed to do that by a, a healthcare practitioner. Um, and there have been a number of studies that have shown that for this population, for people with celiac disease, for people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and also even for people with IBS, that the removal of gluten uh, can lead to an improvement in um, mood symptoms, interesting. which is super interesting. Yeah, there was a meta-analysis published in 2018 by Busby et al. that found that for people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, um, the that uh, in randomized control trials. Now, granted, this evidence is kind of limited. Um, so, you know, the trials are not super large. And this is an area where we definitely need more research. But mm-hmm. they found that for these patients, that the um, that given when given a gluten challenge, they see worsening of depression symptoms, which is super wow. interesting that the consumption of gluten can actually have an, an effect yeah. on the way that you see the world, right? Like symptoms of depression. They can, yeah. It can induce symptoms of depression, um, which again, it's interesting. So going back to this question, which I think, you know, it'll be interesting to, to return to this question as we continue to unpack what bread is. It's almost 10% of the population, if not more, that has problems with gluten, whether they are cognizant of it or not, right? Yeah. So it's very possible that by cutting out bread, which is the number one source of gluten in the American diet, you'll see an improvement in your psychological symptoms. Interesting. Yeah. Do we know why? Does it have to do, forgive me because I can't remember, but you had mentioned the enzyme that opens up that lets larger molecules out of- Yeah, zonulin. Zonulin. Yeah. So do we know, does it have something to do with large molecules leaving the gut or do we not know why? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, And yeah, so what happens in the gut, it's not, the gut is not like Vegas. It's not like what happens there stays there, especially for people who are prone to this leaky gut induced by- exposure to gluten. And that's actually what it is. So, you know, we talked about zonulin. It it leads to this increase, this undue intestinal intestinal permeability. Okay. Which is the jargon way of saying leaky gut. Okay. Which is this term that's kind of thrown around sometimes, many times inappropriately, but it can actually increase. Zonulin is also expressed when we eat something that we're not supposed to or when we're exposed to a bug in our stomachs, it actually can cause the reverse transport of water into the lumen, which causes diarrhea. It's one of the oh, w- ways in which, yeah, our guts get flushed out. It's a protective mechanism. But can it can also have the unintended effect of letting things get into circulation that shouldn't necessarily get into circulation. Okay. Oh, interesting. Food particles. Yeah. Um, proteins that can cause... Uh, intolerances and things Mm -hmm. like that. So actually this is one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of, um, food sensitivity tests. Okay. Because you might show sensitivity to a certain food on a test, but in actuality, you might not actually, you might not be sensitive to that food at all. You might just have a leaky gut Yeah. and you're seeing particles of these foods in circulation that, you know, once you heal your gut, once you fix up your gut, um, you know, that signal will, will go away. And can or can you, be expected to go away. Are they, by cutting out gluten, can you heal that leaky gut and kind of cause you know those particles not to escape and close the yeah grout it up yeah like close it up um, yeah so I'm I'm you know very familiar or well I'm as familiar as one can be without actually being a clinician with the functional medicine protocols mm-hmm. for healing leaky gut and there's a lot of I think within the functional medicine stuff there can be a lot of. Uh, stuff sold that isn't all that backed by science but i think one of the foundational aspects of like a gut, any gut healing protocol is to eliminate gluten along with dairy and other mm-hmm. um you know foods that are prone to allergenicity okay um but yeah so the gut you know what what happens is we can experience inflammation mm-hmm. as a result 
I mean, for one, in our large intestines, we have this universe of microorganisms, trillions, 30 trillion microorganisms that live in the large intestine. Um, and we have some degree of bacteria, some, some po small population of bacteria in the small intestine um, as well. And a normal component of the gram-negative bacteria that live in our large intestine is called lipopolysaccharide, also known as endotoxin. And it's, it's normal, safe when contained in the, in the safe harbor of the large intestine. But when we experience leaky gut, some of that lipopolysaccharide can end up in circulation and cause an inflammatory um, effect. And also, as I mentioned, food particles that shouldn't be in circulation can also cause inflammation as your body responds to these foreign yeah. what the heck um, is this? molecules yeah, that, that, are, that are entering, in, entering into circulation as a result of this, this uh, gut leakiness, so to speak. And those inflammatory, um, the, the molecules that signal inflammation, they're called cytokines. Mm -hmm. um, they don't stay in the gut. They enter circulation. They travel all over. They certainly go up to the brain because the brain needs to know, right, if there's an invader mm -hmm. happening at the level of the gut. And when we are experiencing inflammation in the gut and that ends up becoming systemic inflammation, it's almost like an analogy that I would use or metaphor. It's like a forest fire happening in the gut and the brain sits directly downwind of that forest fire so okay. it, it senses the smoke it has to sense the smoke yeah. right and it causes all of these different um cascades in the body it, there are psychological changes these are known as sickness behaviors so when any animal experiences inflammation it it basically exhibits what are called sickness behaviors thought to preserve energy for the organism so that the organism can heal not spread whatever it's fighting from, whatever it's fighting off mm -hmm. uh, from infecting other, um, you know, other Aspects. members of the herd or whatever, or the group or the tribe. Yeah. And uh, you see in animals reduced grooming, reduced appetite, reduced sex drive, um, lethargy, fatigue, feelings of depression. I mean, depression is now, at least for a subset of depressed patients, being thought to be inflammatory in origin. So... Yeah. So insofar as gluten has this ability in some to create inflammation in the gut, it can also potentially create feelings of depression and all of the other, mm -hmm. uh, all of the other components of sickness behavior that I, that yeah. I just mentioned. Because it sent the signal to your brain being like, there's something going wrong down here. Yeah. Let's reserve our energy for other things. Exactly. Hence, you know, depression and all of yeah. Wow. Interesting. Lack of yeah. appetite. Okay. Lack of appetite. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that your body can do that, but also like a little terrifying that terrifying. something you could be eating that's so common in the American diet. Um, yeah. But there's not more research on it. Yeah. And gluten is not the sole smoking gun in conditions True. like depression totally, or anything, totally. any, anything like that, you know, but, um, but I think it is very empowering to know that for some that depression can be inflammatory in origin because we know how to, we know, you know, inflammation is not, um, it's not so mysterious that we, that we don't know where to look and mm -hmm. what to try as a means of mitigating inflammation. We can improve our diets. We can cut out foods that are potentially pro-inflammatory. We can, uh, cease doing, doing things that are potentially pro-inflammatory, like being sedentary or by, yeah. uh, by, um, you know, exposing ourselves to environmental toxicants, whether it's cigarette smoke or occupational industrial chemicals and the like. Um, so it gives us sort of like a roadmap. Mm -hmm. And also they found that, again, in this subset of patients that you can treat depression with anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, I'm not, I'm not recommending that people go out and start taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like Advil and what have you for depression. But it is very interesting because depression, when we get depressed, we often feel a sense of moral failure. Like, why, yeah. you know, why me? Um, and it makes us feel bad about ourselves, but, mm -hmm. but I think it's, uh, it's very empowering to know that, um, that, that these things can be sort of, uh, extrinsically instigated, yeah. you know, instigated by things are in in our environment because knowing, knowing so gives us an ability, it gives us agency and mm -hmm. it also, you know, gives us an ability to self-treat. Yeah. So what would happen if I or anyone listening stopped eating bread for like 30 days just well, to... Yeah, I think that there's the potential 
and science needs to confirm this, but I think there's a potential that you would see an improvement in your, in your mood. Um, okay. Yeah. Do you love an improved mood? Now, the other thing about gluten that's really interesting is that, well, it is a protein, right? So I think yeah. some will argue that by cutting out bread, you are, you're actually cutting out a, a fairly nutrient dense food, mm -hmm. but I would counter that. Um, because the protein that you see that you get in bread, wheat protein, um, which is primarily, primarily gluten, is actually very low quality protein. Um, so there are a number of ways which we, that we use to measure protein. Um, but in accordance with the gold standard ways that protein is measured, you can look at a protein like chicken breast, beef, fish, eggs, even soy is, is very, you know, is relatively high quality protein. Mm -hmm. um, bread is about, 50% of in terms of the quality of those proteins. And you can look at there's different scoring methods used. The old scoring method, um, it's the PDCAAS, which uh, is sort of uh, what they used to do is they used to feed various proteins to mice and mm -hmm. see the qu the quantity of protein that could be that was recovered in stool in the stool of the mouse. Um, with the assumption that if there was any protein recovered, that would be protein that was not being digested by the animal, okay. right? Um, and then they've since refined that model to the DIAAS. And what they do now is they use a pig. A pig's digestive tract is much more similar to a human's. Actually, a pig's are, um, they use them a lot in studies with the microbiome and stuff like that, just because we have a lot of similarity. The, the digestive tract of, of a pig and other organs too is conserved. Um, from is fairly well conserved from pigs to humans. And so what they do is they, they now will look at the protein that hasn't been digested by the time the food bolus reaches the ileum, which is the latter end of the small intestine. Mm -hmm. So we absorb all of our nutrients in the small intestine. Correct. Right. Yeah. And, um, what they find is that protein from, you know, whether it's chicken or beef or fish or eggs or dairy, even soy almost fully absorbed in the small intestine. Okay you get about half the absorption, um, if not less, with wheat protein. So it's a very low quality protein. Okay. And that's just talking about digestibility. So that's not even looking into the amino acid quality of wheat, which is probably, I'm not sure exactly the various ratios of leucine and all the important essential amino acids in wheat, but I like any plant protein, it's going to be, it's not going to be complete. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so wheat, very low, very low quality protein. Can I ask a clarifying question just for like verbiage wise, but like we're throwing around the term wheat, gluten, and then bread. All bread is mo like we're talking about bread that's made up of wheat. Yeah. I just want to make sure like I We are, yes. So there are other yeah. other kinds of breads, but typically the way that bread is defined is wheat. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a wheat product. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about bread alternatives okay. later on. Like um, and there certainly are some that are wheat free. Right. Um and even among uh, wheat-based breads, there are some that are better, better than others. So like a bread like sourdough bread has mm -hmm. less gluten in it because it's been fermented. Okay. Um, and also there have been studies. There is one study, I think the first author, I have it written down here, Bo et al, 2017, found that um, sourdough bread compared to commercial bread uh, actually led to a lower, when they controlled for carbohydrate quantity mm -hmm. compared to commercial bread, sourdough bread led to less uh, a lower glycemic load so okay. less glucose uh area under the curve yep so a, l a less um glycemic pronounced index. blood sugar spike uh okay. for sourdough bread even after carbohydrate grams were controlled um and less insulin required which makes sense if there's mm -hmm. less uh, glucose entering the bloodstream but greater also satiety so if you are not sensitive to wheat and you know that you're not sensitive to gluten um Sourdough bread is a is a great option. So can you be sensitive? This might be a silly question. Can you be sensitive to wheat and not sensitive to gluten or vice versa? Or are they this? Yeah, you can have a wheat allergy. A wheat allergy, but still be able to digest gluten. Yes. Yes. But okay. wheat would be off the table in that case. And so right. the other the other sources of gluten in the diet are uh, rye, barley, and farro. Okay. Um. So if you don't have a wheat allergy, but you're not sensitive to gluten, gluten. then you can okay. eat those. Then you can, yeah, still okay. keep those grains. I to, yeah. I get them mixed up. I feel like 
gluten and wheat are just used really interchangeably. Yeah. And it okay. I mean, it's kind of unfortunate that so many people struggle with gluten because um it is so tasty. I mean, gluten is what yeah. gives that it gives bread that that gooey mm-hmm. uh you yeah. know, chewy, amazing texture that yeah. like I'm like seeing bread in my mind. Right and now. in fact, in fact, humans we love it so much that it's now at, like bread wheat is bread, no pun intended, to have more gluten and they'll even yeah. add additional gluten to bread just because it makes it so pleasing from yeah. a mouthfeel standpoint. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of people choose to avoid gluten. Um, also that don't have celiac that aren't necessarily gluten sensitive, right? but that have risk uh, of autoimmunity. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there generally like five classes of causes of disease, right? So there's infections, allergens, inflammatory foods, toxins or pollutants and um, stress. So emotional, mental, physical stress. Um, But how does that, how do they play through our genetics and then express as a unique disease or a unique uh, set of symptoms?